Today, we're dressed in Lineage 13. This gang has deadly ties to the Mexican Mafia and it made headlines for multiple bloody wars, stories of extortion, and even a RICO investigation. So they definitely have a story to tell. Yeah. All right. Welcome to Cali's Most Dangerous. Let's get into it. A man is in custody after a string of shootings in the Lenox area. L.A. County Sheriff deputies say it started about seven last night. Two men killed in different locations. A third later shot during an attempted carjacking. On April 30th, 2006, at approximately 7.30 p.m., Gerardo Rivera entered a mini market located inside the Hollywood Park racetrack. Knowing there'd be females there and hopefully some familiar faces, he dressed up, wearing a button-up and slacks topped off with a gold necklace and a match bracelet, and was carrying a few hundred dollars in cash for drinks and other items, as well as having a cell phone, which basically meant he was going to have a lot of attention on him that night. Well, after a day of watching the races, he called a taxi, which dropped him off at El Jalisco Bar near Hollywood Park. A surveillance camera outside the bar saw Oliveira exiting the car and been met in the parking lot by Pedro Vecio, also known as Cisco a Linux 13 member. Also, a surveillance camera inside the bar showed another Linux 13 game member known as Shaggy Rodriguez inside the bar along with Alfredo Ortega, who was wearing a white shirt with the blue or aqua blue design above an emblem or shield in the center chest region. The shirt had a P in the center of the emblem. The surveillance tape showed Ortega speaking with Rodriguez at various points in the evening. At some point in the evening, the surveillance tape show Alvera and Cisco leaving the bar area and walking towards the bathroom area. Moments later, Rodriguez pointed in the direction where Cisco and Alvera had gone and made a head signal to Ortega. He looked at him and made a thumbs up. To which Ortega subsequently joins Rodriguez, Cisco, and Alvera in the bathroom area, which was out of the view of the surveillance camera. A few minutes later, the videotape shows Alvera escorted by Rodriguez walk out of the bar in the direction of 116th Street. About a minute later, the video shows Ortega appearing to run out of the bar in the direction where Alvera and Rodriguez had exited. A witness, Rico Caves, who lived on 116th Street, said he heard four or five gunshots. In addition, he saw two male Hispanics almost directly in front of his window running away from the area where Caves heard the shots. He later identified one of the men as Rodriguez. Although Caves cannot identify Ortega, he recalled the clothing of another man he observed running. He told the officer that the other male wore a tight-fitted t-shirt with the blue or turquoise design on the upper right chest portion of the shirt. After that, Alvera's body was discovered by police about four houses down from the El Jalisco bar, where he sadly lay dead from bullet wounds. In addition, his body didn't have any identification, money, jewelry, or cell phone. After he was identified as a person of interest, the police obtained a search warrant and raided Ortega's home. They found drugs, money, a gram scale, 50 empty plastic bags, and four cell phones. Also in Ortega's closet, they found a white t-shirt that had a shield with the letter P in the middle. The officer opined that that shirt precisely matched the one Ortega was shown in the video that he wore at the Jalisco bar on the night of the murder. The police also seized photographs from Ortega's bedroom which showed him throwing up gang signs and found a shoebox with the words Westside 30204, Linux with three dots on the side, and Lucky written on it. They didn't find Ortega that night, but a few days later, the police arrested Ortega, Rodriguez, and Cisco. When he was arrested, Ortega carried his cell phone, which had the words West Lost Lucky scratched into the surface. And during his interrogation, Ortega denied having anything to do with the murder. He merely admitted to being at the bar that night to have a drink. But Ortega was still charged with the murder of Alvera and placed in a cell with Rodriguez and Cisco in the same jail holding cell with police recording their conversation. Ortega and his accomplices proceeded to make various statements regarding the events of that night. Ortega said, we're gonna get out because they don't have any proof of anything. And let's not be riding out. He also stated, we got rid of those shits, fool. Those shits are destroyed, both of them. Ortega also asked Rodriguez, what'd you do with all the things you stole from that fool? Did you throw them away? Rodriguez responds, yeah, and also explained that he threw away Alvera's cell phone. 
And lastly, Rodriguez asked Ortega what he did with Laver's jury. Ortega responded, I destroyed everything. And in the last part of this conversation, Rodriguez asked Ortega, and you gave it to that fool in the head, huh? Rodriguez then lowered his voice to a whisper and repeated, you gave it to him in the head? The three laughed as Ortega implied that he did indeed shoot the victim in the head. The gang expert testified that he had spoken with other gang members about the gang activity that occurred inside the bar and had learned that the Jalisco bar was inside the Linux 13 gang territory and was controlled by the gang. He explained how the gang would control the bar by taxing customers in the bar by forcing the person to buy them drinks or pay money. He said that failure to comply would result in consequences, like the person could be removed from the bar and punished for disrespecting the gang. He also stated that Alvarez's murder resulted from the gang activity for the benefit of Linux 13. He's quoted saying, you can't show weakness by letting someone disrespect you. That would show weakness and wouldn't let you have the fear and control and the intimidation over the community that you need as a street gang. The jury found her to take a guilty of the murder and sentenced him to life in prison. The situation played out in 2006, and by 2011, due to these activities and close ties to the Mexican Mafia, the gang had an active RICO placed against him, with over 20 of his members charged with multiple crimes. And as you're about to find out in this episode about the Linux 13, they're known around the city for getting money by any means necessary, whether through robbery, drug sales, extortion, even as you learned in this last story, murders, and with their closer ties than usual to the Mexican Mafia than a lot of other Serenio gangs and cliques out here, they're one of the most deadly around. But before we go over these deadly ties, let's get into some history of Linux 13. And this, what's that for? What's I got bullet shot. Bullet shot. Here you go. Got shot. Got shot three times. He got shot. What is that? He got shot. He got shot. They opened it to check. Just like him. Just like him. They got shot. They took out the bullet. Like a month ago. What gang are you a member of? Let's say Leno. Chicago Bulls. 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 Chicago before we can fully address Linux 13 history, we have to get into the area's demographics. According to the 2020 census, the total population in Linux is 22,476, with almost 90% of its population being Hispanic. Underneath the flight path to the International Airport is one of the Mexican quarters, Lenox Boulevard, the violent home of the Lenox gang, youngsters whose hunting ground is in the cheap, low-class housing of Latino immigrants. In addition, 53% of the residents were born in a different country, and 87% of them speak a language other than English in the home. On top of that, only 30% of the residents have a high school degree or higher. And only 3% of those residents have a bachelor's degree or higher, which is a fraction of the national average of 24%. Conversely, 31.5% of the families and individuals live below the poverty line, which is a crazy ass number because it nearly triples the national average of 12.4%. And these numbers, they've been consistent throughout Linux's history. So from the foundation, it was inevitable that this area would produce gangs as well. And in Linux 13, the story played out just as such. Linux was established in the 1960s by Mexican Americans and immigrants, which made up the demographic of the majority of the low-income neighborhood and still do to this day. But like most gangs whose foundations goes back this far, they didn't start off as a gang. It was just a group of teenagers representing their neighborhood. But by the 1970s, this gang was in full form and going to war with damn near everybody. We don't get on with How many? Like a hundred thousand. Like How do you guys protect yourselves? We just got this, kick back, guns, whatever. Where do you keep your guns? Man, stash, stash. Don't tell nobody what to go back. That's because of Spike and Serenios themselves with their alliance with the Mexican Mafia. And the next 13 has ongoing feuds with most other than the gang. This is because these gangs, they've been feuding well before their alliance was established between Latino gangs. This is before the Linux 13, originally known as Linux or Vario Linux, adapted to 13 in the early 1990s. The number 13 showed their alliance to the Mexican Mafia, a notorious criminal street gang located in the California prison system. Because by the mid 1990s, Linux 13, as well as other West Side gangs, ran big parts of the drug market in that area, supplying theirs, as well as smaller gangs as well. In addition, being controlled by the Mafia, they actively committed crimes, extorted businesses, and even assassinated gang members and locals who didn't pay taxes in order to do so. A 
big example it is played out in 1998. Investigators say Uriel Bustamante from Lennox, known as Caps, was one of the most violent Serenos. One day he threatened to kill all blacks on the street. Eugene Bryant ended up dead. De Earl Pounds seriously injured. When Caps and two other Serenos just walked up and started shooting at them, Caps yelling, this is the way Lennox does it. Chapter 3, A Tell of Lennox 13's Daily Ties to the Mexican Mafia. In 1998, David Rubles was a member of the Lennox 13 Street Gang, who went by the moniker Puppet. And Jesse Garcia was an active member of Culver City Street Gang, who went by the moniker Psycho. And being cousins, Rubles and Garcia lived together. In addition, Frank Arnes Jarez and Artero Ars were co-workers of the Westside Clothing Store, located at 2204 Lincoln Boulevard in Santa Monica. Ars was a member of the Santa Monica 17 gang, who used the moniker Termite. On October 27th of 1998, Frank was at the store preparing for his upcoming grand opening. With him, his cousins Michael Jarez and Anthony Jarez, and an acquaintance Matt Vaughn. They arrived at the store at around 7 a.m. And while the men worked on getting the store together, time was flying, but that didn't matter. They had prepared to be there all day. Unfortunately, all that was cut short just before noon, when three masked men entered the store and fired multiple rounds. Frank was alerted to the shooting when Vine ran to the back of the store with a terrified look on his face. Frank saw one of the men wearing a black mask and carrying a long gun into the store through the front door and watched as he began shooting multiple rounds around the store. Frank then ran to shelter in the back office, where he heard a rapid gunfire, then the sound of a car speeding off. When the shot stopped, Frank grabbed his pistol and went to the front store to find Michael laying face down on the ground. He had been shot 13 times and died of multiple gunshot wounds. Anthony, who had suffered five gunshot wounds, was still breathing but died minutes later. Vaughn and Frank, they were also wounded, but they both survived. Amy Phelps, her then-husband, Jason Morris, Glenn Commons, Eric Husband, Robert Mook, and Rick Helser were all raiding in their vehicles in a drive-by line of a Taco Bell restaurant located across the street from the clothing store. While sitting there, they heard multiple gunshots being fired at the store. They saw three men wearing long coats and carrying long guns exit the store and run to a waiting green or blue-green vehicle, which sped away after they entered. Rubles was later identified as the driver, and one of the men, later identified as Garcia, removed a face mask or cap, which fell to the ground just outside the store. Helter then followed the getaway driver for some distance and recorded a partial license plate number, and Phelps and Morris ran into the store to assist the victims. Once inside, Phelps and Frank, noticing that he didn't have too much time left, Pray with Anthony as he died. At a prophecy noon of October 27th of 1998, high school student Janine Gertz left high school early to wash her car, which had been egged during homecoming activities. She then saw two Hispanic males drive up in a green Dodge Neon and parking in front of her home in El Segundo. The men quickly exited the car and walked down the street, leaving the doors wide open. But she didn't think too much of it. But the next day, the car was still parked in front of her house. So Gertz looked inside and observed the ignition had been punched. She then alerted the police, who determined that the registered owner of Neon was a rental car company. The day after the shooting, police executed a warrant at Rubles and Garcia's residence and connected to an unrelated October 9, 1998 home invasion in which Garcia was a suspect. Rubles, Garcia, and another man were present. And both Ruble and Garcia were arrested, convicted, and sentenced to prison. But while they were in prison, police recovered the nick cap that had been dropped at the crime scene. Three holes had been cut in the cap, apparently for the wearer's face and mouth. In 2002, tests revealed the presence of Rubles and Garcia's DNA on the cap. On top of that, there were also other factors about the investigation that let authorities know that these were more than just random killings. The Mexican Mafia's politics played a big part in how everything played out. He said he didn't have it. And they just pointed that gun at his face. And they shot him in his mouth. Chapter 4 Green Lighted by the Mexican Mafia. The Mexican Mafia is a covert criminal organization that operates in prison and controls the day to day activities of Hispanic street gangs. 
It's allied with drug cartels from Mexico and Colombia and requires the payment of taxes from drug dealers in its territories. Mexican Mafia is in prison, designates street gang members to conduct their drug sale business. They have three to four hundred members in prison and you double that on the outside. They have a long, violent, bloody history and the fact that people are starting to turn up dead suddenly could serve as a wake-up call to the Mexican Mafia or La MM is no myth, but instead a cold-blooded reality. The gangs are responsible for contacting local drug sources who are often cartel members and receiving drugs from them. The designated gangs are then responsible for distributing drugs throughout the community, ensuring safe delivery and payment. Taxes are enforcers appointed by the organization are responsible for collecting approximately one third of the profits from the gang's drug sale. With the Mexican Mafia members in prison having a means of communicating with people outside of prison, the Mexican Mafia enforces a code of conduct that must be followed by inmates and the gang members. Gang members are prohibited from informing on other gang members, divulging the secrets of their organization, or displaying weakness or cowardice. They are to attack rivals and represent their organization even when they're outnumbered. They feared us. All the prison gangs, they control the inside, all the criminal activity. Anybody that shows weakness is executed without exception. They are the gang of gangs. Vicious, calculating, fearless, deadly. They kill their enemies, they kill their own if crossed. To get in, you spill blood, and to leave, the blood could be yours. This is life in La M or the Mexican Mafia. The organization disciplines people who do not follow the rules by attacking them or seriously injuring or killing them. Street members volunteer to put in work for the Mexican Mafia in hopes of being invited to join the organization. Such work may even include committing murders on behalf of the Mexican Mafia. The Mexican Mafia issued a variety of rules and regulations which street members were required to follow. One was the non-allowance of drive-by shootings. Group leaders they determined that drive-by shootings resulted in innocent people being killed or wounded, which results in bad publicity or a higher police presence. At the meetings in 1998, this principle it was reiterated. The Mexican Mafia required that gang members exit their car and approach the intended victim on foot, shoot him directly, possibly in the head, to be sure of killing without injuring innocent people. La Emma's influence is well rooted in the streets of Los Angeles. There's the so-called no more drive-by edict. The Mexican Mafia orders the indiscriminate drive-bys to stop or else. Police gang experts say this edict is for real. And these rules apply to pretty much everyone and had deadly consequences if not followed. For example, if an individual or gang in the Mexican Mafia's jurisdiction failed to pay taxes, a hit list would be generated, referred to as a green light list. And the surrounding gangs would be given permission or a green light to attack members of that gang and kill them if possible. Written green light lists were generated by the Mexican Mafia members in prison, who would then circulate the list in the prison system and notify representatives in the street, who would also get the word out. Either a whole gang or individual gang members could be placed on a green light list. Individuals placed on such lists were known as hard candies and were marked for special attention and murder. Such lists were typically written down and duplicated for distribution to multiple gangs. And most of these rules are still followed to this day and are very important in this story. In 1998, the Mexican Mafia used the West Side criminal street gangs under its control to control a portion of the Los Angeles narcotics trade. The Culver City Boys, the Linux 13, and the Santa Monica Gangs were in line with and controlled by the Mexican Mafia. Hector Marroquin, also known as Weasel, was the Mexican Mafia's representative on the streets of West Los Angeles. Marroquin was responsible for collecting taxes, enforcing the Mexican Mafia's rules, and dealing with the green light list. The Linux 13, Santa Monica, and the Culver City Gangs were under American's control and answered to him. The Linux 13, however, was on the 1998 green list because its failure to cooperate with American and Termite from Santa Monica 17 was in the green light as well. Termite from Santa Monica was also ours, one of the guys who was at the West Side Clothing Store. In the game expert's opinion, the green light list authorized the West Side Clothing Store shooting. But the help from an informant really helped tie the Mexican Mafia to everything that was going on. Stephen Dyerich was a DEA agent. In late 1997, Vito Medina, a member of the Linux 13 gang with the moniker Capone, 
contacted the Los Angeles DA office and offered his services as an informant. From a prisoner to a gang hitman, a marked man tells all. In uh, 1971 at San Quentin, I was an aspiring Mexican mafia man. Brought out of hiding to testify against his former brothers in La M. A. For years they've tried to find and kill him. They've come close, twice. He prayed there wouldn't be a third. Every face that I saw uh, was a, uh, to me, was a potential hitman or hit person. Medina was an original gangster, or shot caller, with a higher echelon or elder membership in the gang. But from December of 1997 to April of 1999, Medina supplied information to the DEA regarding narcotics trafficking by the Martinez family, the distribution of narcotics to the gangs, and the activities of the Mexican Mafia and the Linux 13 gang. Medina's information resulted in the seizure of evidence and other convictions as well, with the DEA paying Medina approximately $4,000 for his services. There was also a jailhouse informer as well. In 2006, Robert Kuhl was in custody in the Los Angeles County Jail, awaited trial for robbery charges. Rubles arrived from the jail as well. According to Kuhl, Rubles told him that he was a driver in the homicide committed in 1998. Subsequently, Garcia arrived at the prison as well. According to Kuhl, Garcia stated that he was in custody for two murders and two attempted murders. He said that he had been sent to commit the shootings by the big homies and that the shooters had involved a dispute over money. Garcia stated that four men were involved and that the shootings occurred at the store on Lincoln Boulevard in Santa Monica. Garcia also stated that he was worried a witness who had been at the Taco Bell could identify him. He was also concerned that he had inadvertently dropped a cap at the crime scene. Ultimately, Rubles was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus 39 years to life, and Garcia was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, plus 178 years to life. That's just one story that describes the relationship Linux 13 had with the Mexican Mafia, and there's other deadly situations that led up to the gang being a target for a RICO investigation. But let's fully address who Linux 13 are before we get into that situation. Chapter 5 who were the Linux 13? The Fario Linux, also known as the Linux 13 or LNX gang, are a predominantly Latino gang located north of the LAX airport in an unincorporated section of Los Angeles called Linux. They're located just east of the 405 freeway between north of Century and south of the 105 freeway, which is west of Hawthorne. Members within the Linux 13 gang use the Los Angeles Lakers logo as a way to identify one another. The L in the Lakers represents the L for Linux in the game's name, which is one of the reasons why you see a lot of these jerseys being worn in the area. Not all the members of Lone Boys is merged though. Remember some different cliques are known as for other attire. Speaking of cliques, over the years, they formed more than a couple. A few of them include the Pee Wees, the Psychos, the Winos, and the Night Owls, with the Psychos clique being one of the most active and recent Linux 13 cliques. And with over 650 members, According to the Los Angeles Police Department, it's safe to say that these guys are one of the deepest in their neighborhood. And trust, they have more than a few members who are with the complete activities or dangers for you out of towners. With criminal activities ranging from extortion, armed robberies, kidnappings, and walk down murders, these guys are well known in the city, especially by their enemies. But these activities also made them the target of several gang raids over the years, and even charged with the RICO in 2011. That year, after an 18-month investigation, nearly 500 local and state agencies arrested 27 people connected to the Linux 13. The operation mainly focused on the Linux 13 criminal activities and their connection to the Mexican Mafia. Authorities alleged that drug sales comprised the bulk of the gang's profits. Some of the gang's revenue was paid to the Mexican Mafia in the form of tax that provided them with protection and it helped to operate drug sales in their territory. In addition, the money generated in the gang's illegal activities was used to purchase illegal weapons, drugs, funeral costs of fallen gang members, and money deposits into the prison accounts of incarcerated members. Because of these factors, the raid went after some heavy hitters coming from the Linux 13, a few of them including Miguel Estranda, also known as Stranger, who was a Linux 13 shot caller who was allegedly directly involved in drug sales and extortion of at least one local business. Marco Nero, also known as Sniper, who allegedly supplied cocaine to the gang. George Artel Hercules, also known as Joker in Trouble, who allegedly assaulted innocent citizens on the behalf of the gang. And Jose Manuel Gonzalez, also known as Cyclone, 
who allegedly engaged in violent crimes on behalf of the gang. Also, authorities arrested one woman on a weapons charge, eight on state narcotics charges, five on probation violations, and two on suspicion of being illegal aliens. Today's operation has dealt a serious blow to a ruthless and dangerous street gang operating here in the Los Angeles area, said Clyde Arnold, an agent from the DEA. He also said today's takedown of the Linux 13 street gang is an indicative of the law enforcement's resolve to investigate and prosecute those who use violence and intimidation on promoting and protecting their own criminal enterprises. This definitely was a huge blow to the gang's leadership, financial stability, and overall structure of the gang. But still, this gang's activities continue, and they remain one of the most dangerous gangs in this area. Chapter 6 Danger Rating of the Linux 13 the Linux 13 are going to receive a danger rating of a 9.2 out of 10 based off of the gang's long history of robberies, extortions, and walk down murders. Yeah, these guys, they've been making the headlines in the streets and in the media for all their brutal activity. And their deep ties to the Mexican Mafia make them one of the most deadliest gangs in this area. Yeah, do not come to Linux if you wasn't born in it. Because this gang is known to send shots. You might get hit. Bars, nigga. Now, what do you guys think though? Would y'all went lower or higher? Also, y'all got any crazy stories about these guys? Any close calls? Y'all let me know in the comments. Let's have a conversation about it. Anyways, this gang has more than a few members who have made the game what it is today. And you guys already heard some stories from a few of their members. But trust, it's a lot more we're about to get into that helps justify this score, including a crazy situation that also played out in the 90s. On April 12th of 1999, five members of the Plaza game were in an alley located in the territory claimed by the Plaz and Placentia. Group was just talking, drinking, and joking around, but all this, it was cut short when four other men also entered the alley. Once close enough, they pulled out pistols and let off multiple shots while yelling, Linux is here, Linux is here, as the group ran out of the alley. And while trying to run away, one of the members of the Plaz game, Gilbert Mejia, was shot and killed. And another Plaz member, Jose Miranda, was shot and wounded. After the shooting, the four men then fled the scene, running out of the alley. And this was all the information the cops had up until 2005. While investigating the April 2005 murder of Luis Segura, Placentia Police Sergeant Duran White interviewed Luis Servin, a Plaza Street gang member who had been in the alley with Magia and Miranda the night they were shot. Servin told Sergeant White that the same people who had killed Gia were involved in the Segura shooting. Servin knew Rodriguez and his brother were members of Linux 13. The party stipulated Rodriguez was a member of the Linux 13 on April 12, 1999. In April 1999, Rodriguez was living with his girlfriend, two children, and his girlfriend's father, Pat Jones. Jones recalled that on the evening between April 5th and April 15th, Rodriguez left the house after 6 p.m. and returned at about 10 p.m. in an agitated state. When he returned, Rodriguez told Jones and his brother he had gotten someone back, and we might have just hurt someone. Rodriguez also told Jones he had exited the car, the situation escalated, and someone had been shot before Rodriguez got back into the car and fled. Ultimately, Rodriguez, he was acquitted due to the lack of evidence. But either way, it shows the brutality of this gang when it comes to their enemies, which they have a lot of. The two, nicknamed Sneaky and Trapper, seem yeah, accustomed to police pat-downs, and they are proud of their gang loyalties. You fighting with Inglewood 13? Yeah. Who else are you fighting with? For my enemies. What about Tepla? Step, I don't like Tepla. You don't like Tepla right now, huh? Why not? Chihuahuas. Chapter 7. Rivals and Allies. Inglewood and its surrounding area is one of the most tribal-based areas in Los Angeles County. Tribal in the sense that a lot of these gangs are known to strictly stick with their own crews and not do too much venturing out. And Linux 13 is no exception to this. Linux 13's territory is right across the street from other gangs. For example, Barrio Inglewood 13 is located to their north, and Barrio Tampa 13 is located to their east. And history tells us that these gangs' interactions have always been deadly. But that's not their only rivals, though. Others include 18th Street. Inglewood Family Bloods, Lil Watts 13, the Tunga Crips, and the U-Mob Crips, also known as the 118 Gangsta Crips. Chapter 8, 
prominent figures. Then the Knicks 13s have more than a few prominent members who have made them one of the most feared and respected in this section. But during my research, I found a list of members who lost their lives representing the game. A few men include Tiny, Caps, Woody, Bosco, Lil Spanky, Emmanuel, also known as Mono. Yeah, rest in peace to them, and y'all let me know in the comments of any members who are no longer with us, let their names live on. With that being said, they have a lot of other members who will put the gang on the map. A few of them include Miguel Estranda, also known as Stranger, Bonmero Yoloa, also known as Pena, Cesar Facio, also known as Tamo, Marco Norio, also known as Tony, Sniper, Jose Manuel Gonzalez, also known as Cyclone, Weasel, Joker, Trini, Scrappy, and CJ Midget. On top of that, they have some rappers who have been putting in work for the game recently too. A big one includes Sucker Feet 104. Yeah, and bruh, it's hard. I first heard him a few years ago on a So Rough, So Tough in LA remix. Definitely had some bars he was spitting off. And then I heard him on a West Side State of Mind track as well. And he was giving some game, man. Good storytelling. You should be real catchy punch lines. And overall, he gonna make you wanna come back and listen again. So y'all definitely tap in and let me know what you guys think, man. Also, let me know of any other artists from the game, man. Let's get their music heard. Let's get their music heard. Chapter nine, current state of the Linux 13. Even though the Linux 13 has suffered from a RICO indictment, which resulted in the incarceration of several members of the gang during the early 2010s, as of today, the gang remains active and is still thriving. The Linux 13's numbers have definitely decreased due to most members now being incarcerated or dead. The gang remains one of the most feared and respected in this area, and even have subsets in different states like New Mexico and Washington. But y'all let me know if I'm leaving out your state, man, right for your state. That's it for Linux 13 though. Y'all got any crazy stories about these guys? Any close calls? Also, did I miss anything? Did I get anything wrong? Y'all let me know in the comments, man. Let's have a conversation about it. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you fuck with the video.